Well, thanks, Bryce. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy, happy Valentine's Day. Thank you all so much for being here. Hey, I don't know if you know, but um, if you looked outside and you saw something odd in the sky, that's called the sun. Um, I know we haven't seen that in a couple weeks, and I, I know for me, I forgot my sunglasses at home, and I'm just not used to that, right, to having to take them. But uh, it's so great to be here. And, you know, we all have a story. And if you would have told me that my story, when I was sitting in the same chairs as many of you, especially as students, if you'd have told me that that story would include distinguished or that you, you would have distinguished anywhere near my name, I would have thought you were crazy or that you would have been, been talking about somebody else. I decided actually to look up the word distinguished just to kind of see what it means. And it turns out there's a number of different uh, ways to kind of think about distinguished. And I'll put a few of them up here for us to look at. Uh, but some of the ones that I noticed was you know, successful, worthy of authority or authoritative. You can also think about distinguished in terms of uh, to separate. We can also think about distinguish as to set apart. And so I'm really, I'm really honored to be here when, when Bryce told me about this award back in the fall, and he mentioned that it was this award that recognized a combination of teaching and research. Um, I was really especially honored by that because to me, I can't think of an award I would rather win more than that because it's the only way I've really ever made sense of the role that I have as a professor, and that is to research some interesting topics, some interesting individuals, some interesting uh, you know, people and people groups, and in my case, organizations, uh, and then share that research with people that I care about and that I think can benefit from the information, namely uh, students as well as people out in the corporate world, which I'm fortunate to get a chance to do with some of the work that I do in training and professional development and consulting. And so, uh, in other words, teaching and research for me have always been actually hard to separate, right? So it's an interesting award for me to win that recognizes that how those two things are really intertwined for me. Um, and, and so it's just a real honor to be here. So I'd like to say thank you. So, you know, we, I want us to think about the question of uh, why am I here? It's a question that I think in many ways people have always asked. Matter of fact, each year it registers near the top of the Google, uh, Google's list of most searched Google uh, phrases or, or questions. Matter of fact, I read a book recently that said that why am I here is number two, only behind is Tupac really dead. <laughs> so, I don't know if that's actually true or not, but that's what it said in the book, so I said, okay. So, um, uh, so why am I here, I think, underscores that we're always on a search for, for meaning or for purpose, right? I think we've always, you know, been in a search for that, but I don't know about y'all, but it feels to me like we're in even more of an intense search for purpose and an intense search for meaning today. Does it feel that way to anybody else, perhaps? Um, I think in a day, especially when you know, we think about uh, you know, purpose or meaning or impact as being equated with you know, likes uh, and with hearts and with retweets and with shares and blue check marks and where influence is really synonymous with reach or impact. I think we're always on this search to try to make a difference and try to find some purpose. So what I'd like for us to do is I'd like to draw us to a little bit of a deeper sense of what purpose is really all about. Um, and so what I want us to really highlight and spend our time in is to think about that third definition of distinguished being to set apart because what I want to share with you is when we look at what purpose is really all about at a deeper level, we find that God has set us all apart to do something special for him. Um, and so I'm going to spend 20, 25, 35, an hour and 50, I'm not sure how long, I'm just kidding, but um, kind of walking through a few things. I'm going to have us do a little bit of a discussion, and if some of you have, have had me in class, it's not going to surprise you that I can't talk for much more than about 25 minutes without you having me all do something as well, so we're going to do that. I'll make sure that I leave a little bit of time for questions at the end as well. So um, what, what I want to do is I want to reflect, I want to give some perspective, uh, and then I'd like to inspire you by giving you a few takeaways. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share uh, a little bit about my story. Some of you have heard that story, and some of you haven't heard any of it. It's probably going to surprise you. I'd like to talk a little bit about my research and kind of how my background and my story impacts the research that I do, especially the research that I did that was, that was published last year, which is really what this award uh, focuses on. Uh, and then I'd like to end with a few takeaways. And so here's kind of how we're going to spend our time. These are, this is really just the outline. So I'm going to start off talking about my background just a little bit. So um, work has always been something that has been interesting to me. Um, it's something that I spent a lot of time in graduate school studying, um, kind of figuring out what makes work meaningful, those types of things. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I've always done a lot of jobs. I've always been, I was raised to have a really good work ethic, to really work hard no matter what you do, just to put a lot of effort into what you do. Uh, from a young age, my parents um, just really instilled that in me to, to work hard. 
Uh, my parents are here, by the way. I have to just call them out for a second. Real quick, just stand up so we can see you. So my parents, again, have always instilled a good work ethic in me. And so my, my dad, I'll just tell you, he, he retired a couple of years ago as a successful uh, from a successful business career, and he's one of the only people that I know who finished his bachelor's degree in May and then retired in August. <laughs> so think about that for a second. So he had always had a dream to finish his bachelor's and, and, and then did and then retired. I can't think of a better way to, to go than that, but that's fantastic. So um, to end his career. So always a really good work ethic. I just remember from a, from a young age, you know, helping him uh, do, do, do work either um, if, whether he was paying me or, or not, right? Just kind of doing stuff, and so that was really good. My mom, um, I can always remember, she would always just push me to do uh, a lot, do my, my very best in anything I do. And so the title of my talk is For the Love, right? And, and that's actually a tribute to my mom. I can just always remember my mom saying, Jeremy, for the love, right? If she really wanted to like, emphasize something. And now we use that quite a bit. I, I probably two or three times a week, I'll say, Emma, for the love, go get a hair tie. We gotta go to school, right? <laughs> So I just had to put that in here as a tribute uh, just to my parents. Um, so anyway, again, I've always just I've always had a lot of jobs. My wife and I, uh, we oftentimes will try to count how many jobs we, that I've had, and, and I think every time we count, we come up with a different number. So I think the most recent one is about 22. And so some of the jobs that I've done uh, include uh, being a, a waiter in the night in the graveyard shift at Denny's. Uh, I was a a lifeguard in a big water park in Texas. Uh, I sold vacuum cleaners. Door to door, really expensive vacuum cleaners. I sold two of those, and one of them was to my parents. <laughs> uh, they felt bad. They felt bad for me, so they bought more. Really. I had so much confidence, and then never got a little more after that. But anyway, um, and then let's see, what else have I done? I was a telemarketer back when people like had like phones that were attached to the wall at their houses. So um, I still tried to sell, uh, you know, long distance phone calls, all kinds of weird stuff. So anyway, I've just done a lot of jobs. Um, and, and while I'm mentioning my wife and how we have always uh, sort of counted the jobs I've done. My wife is here too, go ahead and stand up. So, so my wife, uh, her name is Brooke, and I'm just gonna talk about Brooke for a sec why she's not here, but uh, Brooke, speaking of work ethic, she's amazing. She, she's a full-time mom, I mean, and we have two kids, Emma is five and Lennon is two, and, and I say I stress full-time uh, to the fullest extent, right, keeping up with those girls, but she's also a darn near full-time writer, blogger, she just had her first book, came out um, back in November called Call Me a Tightwad, so go ahead and make sure you find that. If you're interested, I can sell you a copy, so. Um, but, uh, and I'll tell you, she, she's just a hard worker, and, and I'm gonna talk to you like you're here, because you are, but I could not do what I do without you, and I, I just love you so much, and I just thank you for who you are and for everything you do for us. So, again, Brooke and I, we count my jobs and we're trying to figure out, so I always just work a lot, and, and that's really, Early on, especially when I was working and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life in college, this is the part that I think is going to surprise some of you. My, my work really suffered, right? My work in college uh, really suffered. And so I'm going to put a few numbers up here on the screen. And, uh, and, and I want, I've got a word there that says rock bottom. Uh, but these numbers represent some pretty important things for me in terms of what rock bottom looks like, but also what a turning point in my life looked like. So. Uh, early on in my college career, I, I knew that college is where you went after high school, and I was pretty good in high school, but I just didn't really have a lot of direction. I really didn't know where, where I wanted to go. Uh, and so at one point, my lowest overall GPA was the top number that you see up there. My lowest overall GPA was a 1.6, uh, and I had been suspended. I was on or, uh, academic probation for a number of semesters. Uh, and as a matter of fact, so many that they said, this isn't enough, we gotta suspend you, I guess, for a year, and that's exactly what they did. And so at one point, uh, my lowest semester GPA was a .9. Um, and if you're like, what does it take to get a .9? It's three Fs and a C. So I'll tell you, that was a semester for me. Uh, and so I dropped out. I dropped out of college uh, for a little bit, and I have I grew up always wanting to be somebody who would, you know, not always stay in the same area where I grew up. And so I just wanted to leave and wanted to go somewhere else. And so um, where, do you, where do you go when you really want to do that? And you're from Texas? Apparently, my not North Dakota. Um, and so I moved to Minot, North Dakota. I had a buddy, a really good friend, who later on in life ended up being the best man in my wedding. Um, he lived up there, and I just I needed to get out and just kind of find find whatever you want to call it, find myself or figure something out. Uh, what I found out was I didn't like it up there, and I couldn't stay up there. So I think I lasted 15, 20 days, maybe, literally. Um, called my dad, and I said, I made a bad mistake. I need you to come get me. I, he was probably on a plane the very next day. And we, and we went home, and I just... Um, after about six months, I re-enrolled back in college at Texas State, and I took a class called Fundamentals of Human Communication. 
And in that class, uh, GPA was 1.6, just to remind you at that point. Um, we, we, we learned about interpersonal communication, we learned about small group communication, and then we learned about speech. And side note, I was an absolutely terrified public speaker, like very high on speech anxiety, so go figure, so here I am. But, um, but that was the first time in college I had made an A in any, anything, and it showed me that I, could, that I could do that, right? I could figure that out if I really wanted to, but it also introduced me to topics that were deeply meaningful to me, right? And I'm looking around, I know there's a lot of communication students in the room, and I know you've had kind of that similar perspective, right? Where you maybe tried some different majors, you maybe were successful or not successful, and then you eventually found it, right? And it was interesting to you. And so that, that was really my story. And so um, I graduated with uh, a 3.27, managed to get that 1.6 in a couple of years to a 3.27. Uh, and then went on to graduate school. And, and I, I mentioned all that to say a couple of things. Um, one is it gave me an, an amazing perspective on the whole concept of meaningful work and ended up influencing so much of what I was passionate about in graduate school and what I studied and now what I help students with in terms of you know, advising especially. Um, but the other thing it did um, is it showed me that, that God's grace is always, is always enough to cover us and no matter how far he seems, he's never gone far, it's just how far did we move. Right? Um, so that's what it showed me. And the last thing I want to say before I move into the second point here is that um, if you're, if you're, like, I've never sat with a student and seen anybody, um, seen anybody with a lower GPA than what I had at one point. <laughs> I mean that, between Marquette and, and Belmont. I've never seen a student with a lower academic record than me. So I want to say that if you're struggling, maybe your number isn't quite that low or you're just kind of struggling through some things, I just want you to know that, um, that I see you because I've been there, right? Um, and, and there is, there is always a way to, to, to get better and to get out of that. And I'm not saying that, if, you know, that you should all become professors and speak in public, but if that's your path, it's possible, right? Um, so I want to share that with you. The second thing I want to mention is it really influenced my, my perspective on sort of what, make works, what, what makes work meaningful. So I want to transition to that now and kind of talk about meaningful work um, as well as purpose. And so I put just a couple of things that I've been, that I've been working on recently is um, uh, some research around the broad area of corporate social responsibility. So I was always interested in like how do people find jobs that are meaningful to them and that hopefully they can make a difference in those jobs as well as make a difference in the world, right? Because clearly what we just learned about my story is that I was not doing that for a while. I was very unintentional. And so I've always been very interested in that. And so a lot of my work focuses on corporate social responsibility and a handful of you are in my class now or have been in that class in the past. Um, but one of the papers that, for instance, that I published last year was with uh, a colleague of mine. We studied um, CSR from the perspective of employees at a large financial services firm. And we really wanted to find out how does a company integrate CSR into its daily practices such that the employees can grab a hold of that and find meaning in that work that they're doing. And, and what, we, what it turns out that um, it's important to realize that a company's greatest responsibility is to its employees. Right? And the more that we're able to make work meaningful, and meaningful work typically involves employees getting to use their gifts and their talents and their skills, that in turn also makes work more meaningful, which then gives them more opportunities to use their gifts and their talents and their skills. Right? That's kind of a simple you know, reciprocal relationship that I just kind of you know, um, represented there. But that's essentially kind of the path that that goes. Um, it's a real simple kind of way to make sense of that. Um, another area or kind of stream of research that I do want to mention, because some of my co-authors and, and collaborators are in the room, but I've been working with, um, with Amy and with Mary and with Nathan. Where's Jimmy? Jimmy Davis? Oh, there's Jimmy. Yeah. We've been collecting data and working now for a few years. We collected some data a few years back from local uh, corporate communication, public relations professionals, um, just to learn like what are the skills that students need to be able to be successful in the workplace and then um, are, we, are we making our curriculum to kind of match that? And that's been something that we've been working on for quite a while. Um, and, and again, if we look back at my, at my career path, if you want to call it that, like all those 22 jobs or whatever, um, I didn't really have a good sense of direction and making sure that what I was learning was going to meet, you know, fit what the world needed. And so that research, I think, has been really meaningful to kind of make sense of that, not to mention make sure that this from a practical standpoint that our uh, curriculum is really matching what the world needs. Um, Another paper that I just want to mention briefly is um, I was, I'm really interested in just areas of ethics and how employees make ethical choices. And so, for instance, I did a case study that got, that got published last year that is actually based on a family connection of ours. 
um, of what does it look like when somebody is doing a job search, but they have a terminal diagnosis, a terminal health condition, and then do they disclose that in in the prospect of or in the process of looking for a job? Does it does an employee have an ethical responsibility to disclose that, and does the employer have the right to ask those questions and kind of try to figure right? And the answer is no, they don't have that right. But is it an ethical responsibility on both parties? So that, that's always been something that's interesting. It's just this, this relationship between ethics and the work that people do in the workplace as well. So those are just some of the things that, that, I've, that I've kind of been up to that I've worked on. And I want to just transition into the, the last uh, main point before we go through some takeaways. Um, but I want to say just all, all of, having said all of that, um, my role as a, as, a, as a researcher as well as as a teacher, um, it, it is all deeply meaningful work to me, but none of it compares to when I'm able to line all of that up with God's purpose for my life, right? And, and realize what that purpose is, uh, and then be able to be intentional every day, waking up saying, God, how are you going to use me today? Um, and so let me let me just provide, I guess you'd say like a, how far are we in here? 20 minute caveat to what I've said, 20 minutes in caveat to what I've said. Because a lot of what I've said so far has been, you know, Think about your gifts and your energy and your talent and your passions, right? And then use those, right? And, and if we're not careful, we can make, you can mishear what I'm saying and think that it's all about you and your gifts and your talents and your passions. And, uh, because here's what I want to, here's what I want to encourage you to think about. I want to encourage you to, to think about shifting that to making it out about you, but devoting your life to, a, to a, a life of stewardship where those gifts and those talents and those passions and those interests are not really yours. They're just they're, they're they're for you to use to make a difference in somebody else's life, right? And into people groups and their and their lives. And so that's really where we get this idea of stewardship. And, and I just want to give some perspective that our lives are not our own. So the idea of, of stewardship is really kind of simple. It's based on the idea that if I give you something, maybe it's a gift, maybe it's something that I let you borrow, and I want I, I want you to give you that back. Chances are you're probably going to think about that a little bit differently. You're probably going to take care of that a little bit differently. How about this? What about if I just give you something? I don't ever expect it to come back. You're just probably going to attach a little bit different meaning to that, whatever I give you, because I've given it to you. I'll give you an example. So I've got, um, uh, Brooke is probably going to laugh at this a little bit when I say it, but I, I've been wanting to play the guitar. I, I just, I wish I worked somewhere where we had some musicians that would help me. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I'm not sure you ever listening. But anyway, uh, so <laughs> I've been wanting to play the guitar forever, and I have a guitar. So a really good friend of mine who's pretty good at playing the guitar gave me one. It's in my closet. And it's funny because there's so many times when I'm like, man, I'll just take that guitar, I'll put it in the attic, I'll put it in the crawl space, because I just haven't been able to commit the time to learning, the, the time you need to play the guitar. But I won't do it. It sits in my closet where it's frankly in my way almost every day, but I won't move it because I want to take care of it, even though he will never expect that guitar back. It's mine. But because he gave it to me, I'm taking good care of it. Right? Like it's mine. I can do whatever I want with it. But I'm really careful with that. And so I just want to encourage us to kind of think about our lives that way as well. Um, because what I found is the more, frankly, the more you try to do you, right, which is kind of a common thing we think here now, do you do you, it can be exhausting, right? It can wear you down. Um, and, and it doesn't always open us up to make the biggest difference. So what I would encourage you is do you, but in the context of others, right? In the context of service, in the context of stewardship. And it's typically going to be a better path and a pathway to make a difference. And so to help you get there, to help you think about this perspective of stewardship, I just want to offer you um, just three simple takeaways. You can think about these as takeaways, uh, but also challenges. Um, the first is, whether we realize it or not, we're all called to something. Now, when I was at that point where I was 1.6 GPA, 0.9, and I changed majors a bunch, and it was just, I didn't know that I was called to something. Um, but I was, and so Bryce actually read, read the scripture already. Um, but in that scripture, if you notice, it says that we are, his, we are God's workmanship. Other translations might say handiwork, which I really like that handiwork, right? Because like if you make something that's your handiwork, chances are you, you think about it differently, you take care of it pretty well. Um, but the, if we translate the Greek word uh, workmanship, we get poema. Everybody say poema. poema. Look at a neighbor and say, you are a poema. And then look at your other neighbor and say, so are you. <laughs> there you go. See? Poema. <laughs> My work comp students are like, man, he's always making us pronounce stuff. Anyway, okay. So poema, here's what I want you to think about that. That's where we get the word poem, right? And so poems are unique expressions of creativity. 
So what God's, what I'm, what my Bible says that the God calls me, my God calls me a unique form of expression and creativity. Wow. Now, I don't know about y'all, but like poems, if I'm being totally honest, like they're hard to understand at different times. Like some, some poems are difficult, right? I see some heads nodding. Like that same guy, incidentally, that gave me the guitar, he'll call me and he'll be like, hey, you gotta listen to this. And he'll like read me a poem. He's like, man, isn't that awesome? And I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I to, like, I have to have him translate it for me, right? Because I don't really understand it. Uh, and, and I think in some ways we're, we're that way too, right? Like sometimes it's hard for us to, to understand ourselves. Sometimes people have to sort of help us see, uh, you know, who we are and what we're capable of and those kind of things. And so we're all unique and we're all gifted in certain ways. Uh, we just got to understand that form of expression and form of creativity so we can be positioned to make the best difference uh, in the lives that, that we're blessed to be surrounded by. Um, the second takeaway for you is, you know, it does take time. I would encourage you not to rush things. I know, for instance, like Jimmy, I'm looking at you. One of the things you like to tell students is um, keep your options open, right? Because as I've heard you say that quite a bit. And some of the students that are in his class are like, yep, he says that. And so uh, even in how he asks you to do his assignments, he likes you to keep your options open, right? Without a lot of strict rubric, so that's good. So uh, don't rush it, but be intentional, right? Don't rush it, but be intentional. And so that, that by the way, I know that kind of sounds a little bit abstract. So for a second, I'm going to get more abstract and then get specific for you. I like to think about, if you think about your life as kind of like a pilgrimage, right? Like when you go on a pilgrimage, um, you go with an open mind, right? Whether it's a pilgrimage of identity, a, a religious pilgrimage, you're going to go to try to better understand yourself, better understand the world. Again, that's super abstract. Let me get specific for you. Let me encourage you, if, whether, if you're a student, I've got two questions that I want you to ask of every experience that you're in. As a matter of fact, every class that you're in, I want you to ask these two questions. What can this class teach me about the world? And what can it teach me about myself? So, especially if you're in some of the belt board classes, right? That they, when we have a belt board, that's, that's phenomenal. It's a big, you know, robust belt board. So how do you go about thinking about takeaways from each of those classes that sometimes you're, you're thinking, man, how am I gonna use this before? Right, like we get that even in a class like speech where you're gonna be talking a lot. It's like, where how am I gonna use this? I'm encourage you, ask those, ask those two questions. Um, and then I would also encourage you if you're not a student, um, faculty, staff, anybody, to ask those same two questions, but sub in class for experience, right? What can this experience teach me about myself and about the world? And that, that could be um, even a sermon you listen to, it could be you know, a small group that you're in, it could be a volunteer experience, it could be really anything. We can ask those same, those same two questions. Hey, one last thing, if you look under your chairs, if you haven't already, there's a handout. It looks like a couple of you already pulled that out. Um, one of the things that I recommended for you is, um, just to kind of be intentional, and then again as a way, some of the stuff that I mentioned kind of was a little abstract, just a couple tools to help it be concrete for you. Um, there's a tool here at the front page, well, I guess depending on which page you're looking, it could be front, it could be back, but one I'm on is story, it's called Story Knowing and Telling. Um, and this is uh, just a handout that I put together that essentially encourages you to just be intentional about thinking about what experiences can tell you and what they can help you learn about yourself. And so for instance, if you do, uh, you know, a study abroad or an internship or you take a core class or you take a service learning uh, or you have a service learning experience, you know, in a class, um, there's a number of ways you can be reflective and be intentional about what that experience is going to teach you and then, and then learn how to, how do you share that with people, right? Like if, a, if somebody in a job interview says, hey, I heard you went to London in your study abroad program, and you're like, yeah, it was awesome. Okay, well, what'd you get out of that? What'd you learn? And so you can kind of, this will help you be intentional about, you know, kind of sharing that story and that. And then this, the back part, uh, it, the other the other side is core values and guiding principles. Um, this is actually something. There's actually a couple students in here that I've been I've been working with um, through that sheet right now. But it's actually originally I started using this sheet in the corporate space to help uh, uh, leaders and businesses define their core values and then translate those into guiding principles. But what I found is it works really well with with students. Right? It works uh, really with anybody with any individual. So in other words, like I've had students recently that have come and say, I don't really know what I want to do. I don't really know kind of who I are, who I am, or what's important. Those kind of things. Um, and so this worksheet has been helpful for me to work with students in an advising capacity, even if it's unofficially, to define what your core values are and to translate those into guiding principles that are going to help you. And there's a couple of examples, and those are those are my personal values as well as guiding principles that I live my life by. And so hopefully that's helpful. Those two sheets just to kind of be intentional. Um, and, and to be a little bit more concrete with some of the things that I've shared with you this morning. So, um, you know, in closing, I've just got, you know, one thing for you to think about. You know, I just want to ask you, what do you see, right? Um, when you think about yourself, when you think about where you are now, when you think about 
your life and where you're going to head or where you want to go after college or whatever it is, um, what do you see? Sometimes it's difficult for us to see, to, to, to really know our potential, to know what our purpose is. Um, but what I want you to be encouraged to think about is that God knows you. Um, he knows who you are. He knows what he made. And he doesn't have any regrets about who you are and what he's made. Um, and, and so I just want to encourage you to be thinking about shifting your life as one dedicated um, to service and to stewardship. And I found that that is, it's, it can be challenging, but it's a recipe for a life set apart and it sets us up to be truly distinguished.